So our church family here at Narkensi, we're celebrating our 70th anniversary as a church. Like November 1st is our actual birthday, but we're celebrating all year because, well, we should, right? We should. And we're taking a few weeks this summer to think about uh, our heritage as a, as a people. Uh, we didn't come from nowhere. There were groups of people before us who laid the foundation. And so we've been studying the scripture and the things that were important to them with the understanding that we too are creating a heritage and we're laying a foundation for those that will come behind us. And so um, thank you for being a part of this and encourage you to to read along in the scriptures and to have conversation and to talk about these important things. You know, in, in our heritage, and back in the day it was coined the Restoration Movement, and uh, the early 1800s, and they had these tenets. We, this is a little truth and review for you. Um, the, uh, the flow of the series, we've seen these kind of three movements the last three weeks. You know, we've talked about how the gospel is, is what we have. I mean, as a heritage, we are a people of this message of God. The gospel is all that we have really to offer the world, but it's all that we need. And it's the good news of Jesus is what people need as well. And we've talked about how the gospel encourages us to promote unity among us. And Jesus prayed in John 17 that we would be one, just as he and the Father were one, that we would be one. There'd be unity of heart and mind, kind of an agreement in spirit and intent to be people of God in this place. Unity is not just a nicety that it would be nice to have. No, no. In the kingdom of heaven, it's really important for the sake of, and we talked about this last week, for the sake of the mission. In that same prayer, Jesus prayed that we would be one, just like he and the Father are one, so that the world would believe that God sent Jesus. In fact, in that paragraph, Jesus says that twice, that the world may believe. And so if God's people are not unified, if there's divisions and arguments and factions, uh, the world's going to look at that and like the message of the gospel is not is not going to matter because the evidence of our lives is that it doesn't really make a difference. But when the gospel makes the difference that it may, it, it's the power of God and the salvation. It's the only thing on the planet that can change a human heart. And as we are in that number, a part of his church, part of his family, who hearts, our hearts have been changed, we're propelled towards this unity in Christ because in Jesus we have everything in common. And when the world, who's, you know, everybody is broken and needy and don't even, we don't even know what we need these days, but when the world sees the power of the gospel live through his people, then the mission, there's fertile soil for the mission. We have a message. It's being lived out in our lives. So this is some of what we've been talking about, and uh, our heritage is so strong. I mean, uh, uh, to have this as who we are looking back, it's so strong as we continue forward, um, God willing, into the next 70 years, if Jesus doesn't return, right? So in this movement, you know, in our heritage, they had these great tenets, these things, these phrases that they would say. And so we've talked about this, you know, they would say, no creed but Christ, no book but the Bible, no name but Christian, no creed but Christ. You know, the the human creeds were set aside and we just want Jesus. No book but the Bible. We're free to read all kinds of books, commentaries on the script. I mean, that's all fine. But when it comes to the book that has authority to speak into our lives, there is no book but the Bible for that purpose. And then no name but Christian. The people were coming, you know, a couple hundred years ago, they were coming from all of the different uh, flavors of Christianity. And the unity was found. And let's just use the, the names uh, that the scripture talks about. So they were first called Christians at Antioch, the book of Acts tells us. And so they said, let's be Christians. Uh, You could also, you know, Church of God, Church of Christ, The Way. Those are all names for God's people in the scripture. And so let's use those names. Um, These were the tenets that they lived by. There was another tenet that they embraced wholeheartedly. Um, It went like this. In essentials, unity. Non-essentials, liberty and in all things, love. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty or freedom. And in all things, love. Today we're going to talk about in all things, love. 
You know, I grew up in this heritage, actually. I'm grateful for it. I grew up at the West Seattle Christian Church, which is in uh, West Seattle. And, <laughs> and I grew up with, and when I went to Bible college, for, for the bulk of my life, I thought, because this tenet was so embraced as a truism, as important, I thought our heritage people back in the day that they coined this. My, the bubble was popped for me. Someone said, you know, Augustine actually said this. I'm like, Augustine? He lived in the 300s. And if you do some research, which people have, Augustine didn't say this. Uh, and it wasn't that old. But there was a guy, Rupertus Meldinius, who actually said this. What a name it like that. Rupertus Meldinius, if you're having a child soon. Here's... <laughs> Uh, he lived in the early 1600s, so 150, 200 years before the restoration movement on the American frontier, this guy in Germany said, not in English, but in German, in essentials, unity, non-essentials, liberty, and in all things, love. You know how awesome it is that, uh, that the people who began our movement, our heritage, they embraced this? You see, we don't have to create everything from scratch. We don't. In fact, we have the Word of God that teaches us everything we need to know. And when they found something that says, yes, that's it, they embraced it as their own. In fact, they were coming from all of the different church groups, and they could all agree on the importance of having unity in the essentials, freedom in the non-essentials, but in, in everything, there is to be love. So that's what we want to talk about today, just the importance of uh, a love. What we want to be, as the people of God in this place, we, we want to wrap everything in love, all that we're doing, every gathering that takes place, every ministry that we're doing, everything needs to be wrapped in God's love. We want, in all things, love. I mentioned that Philippians 1 passage, but just... To, to read verse 9 again, when Paul says to the church in Philippi, this is my prayer for you, that you abound more and more. No, 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 that's not it. That your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. This amazing love of God, this self-sacrificial, unconditional love of God that we learn about in the gospel you are not going to ex, uh, come to the end of it. It's the kind of love that can abound more and more and more. You're not going to get to the end of it. And Paul prays for the church there that their love would abound. They would just increase, even exponentially, their love for one another and their love for their city would just grow and grow and grow. I pray that you, your love would abound more and more in, in knowledge and depth of insight. Really important. As we come to know this great God and Savior, the, the, the knowledge that we learn, the insights that we're given, even as we walk in relationship with the Holy Spirit, the insights that we're given, it will result in love that's abounding more and more and growing. Paul goes on, verse 10, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. It is amazing what the love of God in Jesus Christ, given to us in the gospel message, what it does for us. It can change a human heart, but it, it goes beyond. It actually helps us, right? What does he say? That we be able to discern what is best. And in these days that we're living in, where there is so much confusion and so much difficulty actually figuring out what is best? Actually, the love of God that can abound in knowledge, depth of insight, in relationship with him, this love of God we receive from him, it actually can help us discern what is best. And, Paul writes, be pure. L live a life, right? Live a life that is pure and reflects Jesus. A life that has this fruit of righteousness that comes from him. We spent several weeks, didn't we, talking about the fruit of walking with Jesus. This Galatians 5, fruit of the Holy Spirit. And love is the first one mentioned. Love is to be this virtue that, like, covers them all. In fact, in, in Colossians chapter 3, 
If you turn a couple pages to the right, Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, Paul writes to the church in Colossae, he says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if you have any grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. This is the nature of love. It is the chief virtue. It is the one that all the other virtues, which all of them are significant, all of them are powerful, but love kind of wraps them all. They, you know, Paul says they bind, it binds them all together. If you have any of the virtues without love, you don't have all that God wants, but with love, right? The love of God in your heart, the love for one another, you can do things like forgive. How many stories have you heard recently of somebody who forgave another person of an unthinkable, an unthinkable trespass against them, but they forgave them? And without even hearing the rest of the story, you know that person knows Jesus. Because the love of God is like that. It wraps everything together. It binds it together in perfect unity, Paul says. We want to wrap everything we do in the love of God, that everything would have this quality to it. It's done with grace and peace and, yes, but love. It's done with love. In all things, love. So, in essentials, liberty, non essentials, liberty, in all things, love. You know, We've been talking, in the essentials, we want to have unity, a sameness of mind and heart. There are hills, as Marcus led us in the last couple weeks, there are hills that we die on. And these, however, are probably fewer than we think there are. There's a lot of hills that we're going to die on that, you know, you probably don't need to die on that one. It's probably more of a, what, uh, an issue to discuss or just define. There are very few. The ones that we die on are the ones connected to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Like, who is Jesus? Who is he? And is what he did on the cross, was it just a part of history, Jewish and Roman history? There was a man, Jesus of Nazareth, who died. Or was the death of Jesus on the cross intentional from God for the purpose of saving humanity? Is the blood that Jesus Christ shed, is it sufficient to save any human heart? That's, that's the things of the gospel, the things that we, we say yes and amen. We have unity in those things. In the non-essentials, there's freedom, there's liberty, and there's so many of these. And we want to be a people, continue to be a people who, where there's absolute freedom. You don't have to agree with me on so many things. And yet we still have relationship and fellowship and unity in Christ, even though we d disagree on all kinds of things. In fact, some of, the, some of the problems, if you look at church history, is people drawing lines and, and dividing among things that really are not essential, not important. And we're not to be those people because we value unity. And if we wrap these conversations in love, it will always be done in the right kind of way. We want in all things there to be love. Uh, my own feeling, you know, in fact, I've coached the staff on this and, and anybody else who will listen. Uh, but the word essential, in my life I've seen this a lot. The word essential is a fighting word. Someone comes and they say, so, you know, the, the, the historical, the traditional one that's like, far and away is the, is the issue of baptism. Neil, it sounds like you think, think very highly of baptism. I do. Do you think it's essential for salvation? <laughs> and if we talk, let's talk about what's essential for, essential is a fighting word, right? And so I, I, I just, you know, let's talk about it, right? Let's, we'll just use baptism as the example because it's happened just so many times that it's, it's still intriguing to me. Our, the, the people of our heritage had another tenet that has been beautiful and wonderful for me, and we should keep this one around too. They said, use biblical words 
for biblical ideas. And if you grab your concordance, you will not find the word essential in the Bible. It's not there. It's not there. And so we're, we're not, we don't have to use that word. It's helpful. I mean, we know what we're talking about. And yes, unity in those things. But you don't have to use that word. You can use biblical words for biblical ideas. So in the conversation about baptism, it's gone like this for me. It's like, do you think baptism is essential for salvation? I'm like, well, I think it's a part of our response to God and what Jesus has done. What do you think about it? And then they'll share with me kind of how they see the place of baptism. And then again, what do you think? Is it essential? And I'll say, well, I think, I think that baptism is for the forgiveness of sins and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What? You think what? That ba- the actual forgiveness of sins, baptism is a part of that? And the relationship with the... Like, who, where do you get that idea? I said, well, in Acts 2, I, I'm actually just quoting Peter. And I, it's not a gotcha moment. I really would encourage you not to, like, do a gotcha moment. It's tempting to do that. Like, gotcha. I'm actually quoting Peter. Huh, you know. Uh, don't, do, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. As fun as it might be, you know. Uh, now, I do that to Marcus all the time. But don't... <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> so, uh, but to actually use what the Bible says on any of the topics, I would just encourage you, whatever the topic is, since we have no book but the Bible, what does the Bible say? And do not hesitate to actually use biblical words for biblical ideas. And in Acts 2, after Peter preaches the first gospel sermon that talked about who Jesus is and what he did on the cross, the people were rightly, it says, cut to the heart. And they said, brothers, what do we do? That was the right question because the gospel of Jesus always kind of brings us to the point of I have to respond in some way. I've got to respond to this. So what do I do? And in verse 38, Peter and the other disciples said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, even in that verse, you know, because, you know, the whole water regenerationalist thing, like we talked about a couple, three weeks ago, you know, no, no, no. Because even in that verse, it's not just baptism, it's repent. Repent and be baptized. In fact, if you are baptized with no repentance, is there the forgiveness of sins? And the gift of- if you get baptized with no repentance, you just got wet is all you did. There must be faith. There must be repentance. There must be the confession of Jesus as Lord. Right? And rightfully to respond, to say, yes, Lord, I will yield. Baptism is such a humbling moment. It's also a moment of celebration where you say, I I will allow myself. Nobody baptizes themselves. There's humility wrapped up in there. There's like Romans 6 talks about the identification with Christ. You're actually being identified with Jesus, just like he died, was buried, rose from the dead. So we die to ourselves. We're buried in water, raised to live forevermore. That's, you celebrate. Humility, then celebration. That's what's going on. It's beautiful and it's powerful. All that to say, use biblical words for these biblical ideas. We, we think of the whole New Testament as being essential. There's no part of God's word that we would say, yeah, that's not needed. Let's toss that out. So as you talk about different things, remember to use the Bible. It's the book that God has given us. It speaks into our lives. What we're learning right today is we want to, everything that we do needs to be wrapped in love. In all things, Love as followers of Jesus, committed to his gospel, which propels us to be one with one another for the sake of the mission. We want to wrap all of that in love. On the, you know, the things, the essential things that people talk about, we wrap it in love. We refuse to argue. We'll discuss, we'll talk, we'll hold to our convictions, but we're not, we're going to wrap it in love. In non essential things, there's great freedom. You know, the stereotypical people divide and split churches over the color of the carpet. Really? It's been known to happen. And of course, you know that it really has nothing to do with the color of the carpet. 
It's more about people not love, loving one another, probably both directions, and right, not being heard, being injured, you know, sinning, not forgiving, all kinds of things go into that. But we don't want to elevate things that need to not be elevated. We will discuss them, we'll define them, but we will, we will wrap it in love. And when, uh, when there is a hill to die on, We'll wrap that in love too. Our attitude will be the same as Christ Jesus. Our posture is to be like Christ. We want to reflect him and his unconditional self-sacrificing love for us. We reflect him as, as we move forward as his people. We want to wrap everything in love. We had went to week of missions uh, a couple weeks ago and Dr. Gene Sonnenberg was the Bible lecturer. He's actually a retired professor from Hope International University, and he was sharing about some of the same heritage. It was really amazing. You know, Marcus and I were taking notes, like, yeah, 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 yeah. One of the things he said was, uh, he was quoting somebody else, um, but said that wherever in the world you go and you find uh, someone who believes in Jesus, you find a child of God, you have a brother or sister in Christ. Everywhere you go. The kind of unity that we're talking about is whenever we see somebody, meet somebody, and you have Jesus in common, you have everything in common, and you pursue unity with them. He actually reduced the essentials that are required for unity with another brother or sister in Christ. He kind of redefined and boiled down unity to one phrase, and that's this one, Jesus is Lord. Whoever you meet, coworker, someone you go to school with, someone maybe you have great disagreement with, but they can say, but Jesus is Lord. They're your brother, they're your sister, and unity is what what you're to pursue in love. You can disagree about everything, but if you agree that Jesus is Lord, it's everything, isn't it? In in, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, Paul wrote these words. He says, therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Do you see this? If someone is able to say, Jesus is Lord, they are speaking right, by the Holy Spirit. The, only the Holy Spirit you know, does all this work in our hearts to bring us to God and to tell us of his love so that our love can abound more and more. I mean, to change our human hearts, it's by his Spirit. And if we are saying, or if someone else is saying, Jesus is Lord, it's by that same Holy Spirit. And if that is the case, unity is to be pursued. It was really a beautiful moment on the last night. Dr. Gene actually went through the whole list. I don't think he missed a one. So whatever heritage or church tradition you grew up in, I mean, every single one, whatever church grandma took you to when you were a little kid, whatever the label was on the, on the sign of the church, Dr. Gene mentioned that, because one by one he says, and, when it, when it's, and with this, you know, we should be more like them you know, because of this. And for the, and for the uh, Baptists, we should be more like that. And for the Pentecostals and for the Lutherans and for the, and he went down the whole list. We should be more like them. We should be more like them. The every, all these lovers of God, people that can say Jesus is Lord, they've all had these strengths and things that were important. And it's worth wrapping it in love and pursuing unity for, with them. Why? For the sake of the mission. If someone, you know, he didn't say it, but I was thinking, yeah, and for our heritage, people, other churches should be like our, our church in pursuing unity because that's been what's so important to, our, to the hearts of our people through the years. May it continue to be so. What's beautiful is that it is being so in our community. The city church is vibrant and active and growing. There's things being done in Jesus' name, things that we can and should be celebrating, things that we need to participate in because Jesus is getting just, uh, he's becoming more and more famous. He's getting a good, good report as God's people walk in unity and love. So the gospel and unity for the mission, we wrap all of that in love. The gospel itself is a gospel of love 
God is love. John wrote, 1 John 4, God is love and he loves us. In fact, we love because he first loved us. So it's important as you wrap everything in love that you stay connected to the vine, you stay connected to Jesus and receive his love because you need to have his love in order to give his love. We love because he first loved us. God demonstrated his love for us in Jesus. Romans 5 eight. while we were still sinners, God's love was demonstrated to us in Jesus and that he died for us. So the cross is a message of his love. And even Jesus himself, well, while dying on the cross, he, he wrapped the cross in love, didn't he? He would say, Father, forgive them. For they don't know what they're doing. He would say to John, uh, John, here's your mother. Mother, here's your son. While he's hanging and dying on the cross, this is a message, this is a gospel of love, God's love for us. Uh, this unity that we're pursuing, well, it's seen in as how we love one another. Pursuing unity will actually look like family. It will look like family who love one another deeply from the heart because God's made us brothers and sisters. We have one father and he so loves us, we, it just spills over and we love each other. And as we love each other, there's unity, there's oneness of mind, and God receives glory through that. So we wrap that in love. What do we do when we disagree? You know, the, 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 the wrong thing to do is say, okay, we're good. Nobody disagree with anybody. We're not looking for conformity or uniformity. We're looking for unity. When disagreements happen, we love one another deeply. There's still fellowship in the midst of even the hardiest of disagreements. And when we transgress, when we sin against one another, which does happen, what do we do? For the sake of the mission and for the unity of the church, we love one another. We forgive each other just as in Christ God has forgiven us. You may be here today and really struggling with forgiving somebody. You may be really like, I don't think I can do it. I can't do it. And maybe you can't. God is gracious. He gives us time. But my encouragement is allow your mind and your heart to go back to and reflect on the love that God has for you. Because when you think about his love for you and all that he has forgiven in your life, it becomes a lot easier. I mean, we start forgiving one another because we've been so forgiven. And then we wrap the mission in love too, in all things love. So when it comes to the mission, we're not beating people up with the Bible. We're not shouting from the corners with bullhorns. I saw that the other day over on Chambers and 11th, a guy with a bullhorn. And uh, I rolled the window down to hear what he was saying. And then I rolled it back up really fast because it was so loud. So loud. You know, one of my favorite ways to express it is the mission that we have is we, we are loving people to faith in Jesus. And the unconditional love, the, the patience that Christ has for us, we, that's, these are all the things that we do. We love people to faith in Jesus. And like Peter, you know, says, always be ready to give, uh, you know, to give an answer to those who are asking you for the hope that you have. We are ready. We want to be ready. But we don't beat people up with the good news. You beat people up with good news and the good news isn't good anymore. We love people to faith in Jesus. We wrap the mission in love. And in so doing, we're reflecting the love of our Savior, aren't we? We love all people. If truly we have no creed but Christ, it'll be Christ and his love that we will have to share. And if we have no book but the Bible, it will be the message of the Bible, this message of God's love for us that we will be sharing, this, this self-sacrificial, uh, unconditional love that saves people. This will be our message. And if we have no name but Christian, Christian will retain or regain uh, it's being a synonym for love. A Christian person is a loving person 
because we are following Christ. We've taken on his name, right? We've taken on his name. And we're like Christ. Jesus wrapped everything in love. Let's be people like him. Let's depend on the love that God has for us. We are a people who are holy and dearly loved, right? Colossians 3.12. We are holy and dearly loved. Remember how much we are loved. I invite the worship team to come back up and lead us. Sometimes we forget, don't we? If you forget how dearly loved you are, you can be led down all kinds of places that you don't want to go. But if you can remember that God loves you, he has set you apart, all of your sins, all of that's been set aside. You are actually, when God looks at you through Jesus, he sees the beauty and the righteousness of Christ. There's nothing separating you from the love of God. Nothing at all. And so we can have hearts, right? We can be people who say, God, I, you know, you, you so love me, I'm willing to echo the prayer of Jesus, not my will, but your will be done. I don't know what the future holds, but I know you know, and I trust you with what's going on in my life. I trust you with my future. You receive God's great love in order to be people who reflect his love. We want to wrap everything in the love of God, amen? Mm-hmm.